I want to share some thoughts with you that emerged this past week, both from being a human being, responding to what's going on in our country and in the world, and from reading and learning our Torah portion and struggling to try to make sense and make meaning out of all that we're experiencing right now. This week, a person who calls himself a religious Jew requested for the impeachment trial to be postponed because he is Shomer Shabbat. He is a Sabbath observer. Days later, Twitter erupted when the same person put his hand over his head and whispered a bracha, a blessing, before sipping water. That is the image that our country saw this week of a religious Jew, a person who somehow came to understand that his Jewish religious commitments would bar a person from working on Shabbat or drinking without a bracha, but not prevent him from defending a promulgator of the big lie, a person who fueled false and racist allegations of a stolen election that led to violence at our capital and the deaths of several people. I want to tell you that even though this is hard to talk about as a person of faith and as a Shomer Shabbat Jew myself, I took this personally and I know that I'm not alone. This person is by no means the only or even the most egregious reflection of religion gone awry. The last several decades have unleashed a host of so-called religious actors engaging in regressive attempts designed to curb the rights and freedoms, often of already vulnerable populations in God's name, and even fueling or committing acts of violence in God's name. For me, among the most disturbing images that we saw from January 6th was when a group of insurrectionists in the middle of storming the Capitol stopped to pray on the Senate floor. And this is what they said. They said, thank you, Heavenly Father, for being the inspiration needed to allow us to send a message to all the tyrants, the communists, and the globalists. This is our nation, not theirs. Thank you for allowing the United States of America to be reborn. Make no mistake, this is the expression of a violent extremist nationalist movement in our country today. And because on this Shabbat, we're marking Reproductive Freedom Shabbat, I want to add that this is the same brand of violent religious extremism that's been growing in dominance in America for years. Religious extremists have been a driving force behind restricting women's access to health care for decades. It's what drove a man who claimed deep religious conviction a few years ago to walk into a Planned Parenthood clinic in Colorado Springs with a semi-automatic rifle shooting and killing three people and wounding nine other people. His social media alternated between praise of God and praise of those who attacked abortion providers, saying that those were the people who were doing God's work. It's that same very violent religious extremism that inspired people who call themselves Muslim to fly planes into buildings. And do you remember what happened last year to Rabbi Moshe Yehuda, the 80-year-old Israeli activist with Rabbis for Human Rights? He was out with a group that was volunteering to help Palestinian farmers in the West Bank with their olive harvest. When a group of masked Jewish settlers, all of them wearing tzitzit, beat him so badly with crowbars that he was left for dead. And it makes you wonder, is this what it means to be religious today? I know there's a lot of noise these days. There's a lot for us to be talking about and worrying about and concerned about, but I wish this is what we were talking about in every synagogue, in every church, in every mosque in our country. This violent insurrection was driven by white Christian nationalism by the idea that defending a person of, in, in Catherine Stewart's words, spectacular turpitude was better in their eyes than the horrifying freedom that religious moderates and liberals like us, along with many Americans who don't happen to be religious, offer the world. One of the now prominent senators, a lead soldier in this war, explicitly calls this his charge. This is what he says that his work is to take the Lordship of Christ, that message into the public realm, and to seek the obedience of the nations, of our nations. 
This is not new. For as long as religion has existed, it's been manipulated to serve the most nefarious acts and to serve the most violent and destructive ends. And for centuries, religious practice has been decoupled violently from religious purpose, piety from performance, so much so that today it's barely even notable to encounter so-called religious people behaving in absolutely abhorrent ways. And I've been thinking since January 6th of Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor in Brothers Karamazov. He writes this image of Jesus coming back in the time of the Inquisition just one day after 100 so-called heretics had been burned. And, and, and after he performs enough miracles that the people recognize him and they recognize his divinity, he's immediately arrested by leaders of the Inquisition, the same people that tortured our ancestors for their lack of devotion to him. The Grand Inquisitor then goes on to tell him that the church no longer needs him. And I have to say, it's an eerie parallel to our own Tanr Shel Achnai story, in the, in, the, in the Gemara when, when the rabbis point to the heavens and say, lo he, but we'll explore that at another time. The Grand Inquisitor then sentences Jesus to death, this man that they called God, citing his very presence as an interference in the work that they were doing ostensibly on his own behalf. Dostoevsky's reflecting on the same perversion of religion that we see today. All of these people acting with all this sacred outrage willing to defend the indefensible, even willing to commit violence, some of them in God's own name, all that purported religiosity. It's no wonder people wanna have nothing to do with organized religion. Yes, Purim is coming along with its eternal reminder that the world can turn on its head in an instant. But if you live in the upside down world long enough, you start to forget that there is a right side up. And yet, there most certainly is a right side up. And that brings us to this week's Torah portion. What happens after the transcendence of the divine revelation at Mount Sinai? Our parsha begins, These are the rules that you have to set before the people. Exodus chapter 21. Here are the laws. Here's how you translate the most radical lessons of the Exodus, the commitment to human dignity, to freedom from oppression, to radical equality. Here's how you translate all of that into a functional society. You build a legal system, make it fair and just, make it one that holds people accountable for their actions. If one person strikes another, if someone's ox gores another person, if one leaves a pit uncovered and then his neighbor's animal falls into it, if someone steals, if you light a fire that causes damage to someone else's property, if you borrow something from a friend and then you break it, if you find your enemy's lost animal, there are consequences. Read the Parsha, read this week's Torah portion. There's nothing sexy in here. We have fully transitioned now from the sacred to the mundane, from the fire and the thunder and the lightning, from God's own voice echoing through the desert canyon to dozens and dozens of laws detailing the building of a just society. What is it coming to teach us? Several years ago, I remember that a colleague of mine was particularly upset that clergy were weighing in on issues of equity in access to healthcare. The devil is in the details, he said. Let clergy deal with matters of theology and spirit. Let the politicians figure out policy. But our Parsha suggests that the details, that's precisely where God lives. As Abraham Joshua Heschel famously wrote, the teaching of Judaism is the theology of the common deed. The Bible is concerned ultimately with everydayness with the trivialities of life. The prophet's field of concern is not the mysteries of heaven, the glories of eternity, but the blights of society, the affairs of the marketplace. That's God's business. And our Mishnah, 2,000 years ago, translates the principles that we encounter this week in the Parsha into a well-articulated legal theory. So here's Bava Kama, chapter three, second Mishnah. How far must a person go in order to ensure that we do not, God forbid, cause harm to another person, purposely or even inadvertently. So say you pour your water out into the street after cleaning, 
and then your neighbor walks by and slips in that water and breaks her leg. Even though it's totally legal for you to bring your water out to the street, you, according to the rabbis, are liable for the damages that you inadvertently caused. That's a very high bar for social responsibility. And in the eyes of our tradition, it's absolutely essential to the building of a just society. So think of it. There are always unintended consequences to your actions. So when you walk through the world, our tradition says, walk with care. But don't think that this is just about protecting yourself from a lawsuit. This is not about protecting from liability and damages. This kind of extreme care, our rabbis say, this kind of extreme sensitivity, especially around the welfare of others, this is what it means to be a religious person in the world. Rabbi Yehuda asks, a person who really wants to be considered pious, what should he do? Go and learn all the details of the laws of damages. Theft, lost property, lost wages, fair and just business practices. So you don't harm another human being. What should a person do who wants to be considered pious? You might think he would say, go out into the mountains and contemplate the Holy One, but that's not what he says. Because to be a religious person, a pious person, is to marry the sacred and the mundane. You want to be pious? Go to the market and be decent. That's how you create a world that's hospitable to the Holy One, by honoring God's own image in human beings in the here and now. Our big dream is nothing short of a world redeemed. In this world, we hold every person with dignity and love. But the way that we one day arrive in that promised land is by building an infrastructure here for a just and equitable society. There's no separation barrier between religion and ethics. They're entirely bound up in one another. Our most audacious religious dreams are made manifest only through daily acts of justice. God is in the details. You can't observe Shabbat and then violate basic principles of human decency and be considered a religious Jew. Religious practice is heresy if it does not lead to the cultivation of a religious consciousness. Compassion toward other human beings, awareness of sensitivity to human suffering, truth-telling, honesty, love. I sometimes imagine a Dostoevsky-like visit from the Holy One in our time. And I think not only, forgive me, of what we would do to God if we could, but of what God would do looking out at the great big mess we've made, the degradation, the humiliation, the violence that we are perpetrating against one another. And I imagine God, I imagine the Holy One weeping but God isn't crying only for our failures, but for the fact that we have the audacity to perpetrate those failures in God's own name. Imagine the heartache, knowing that you have been so deeply and painfully misunderstood. This is our challenge. People of faith are lifting up a different image of what it means to be religious today, and we need to be a part of that. Rabbi Yehuda asked us, what should someone do who really wants to be pious? Well, you can't be pious if you don't lead toward freedom, if you don't lead with love. So instead, I pray that we let our faith be an affirmation of the dignity of every single person, each one of us an image of the Holy One. I pray that we let our faith open our hearts to others with compassion, with tenderness. I pray that we let our faith remind us that we belong to one another. Let our faith give us hope as we work to achieve the shared redemption narrative that includes every one of us. Let our faith be the fuel, the driving force in our commitment to build that just and equitable society, a society of radical accountability, a home in which all people can live with dignity and with love. That is the only way that we will reach the promised land. I wish you Shabbat Shalom.